you. Uh, I want to read to you Isaiah uh, 52, uh, 7, uh, from verse 7 till 10. It's coming up. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say in Zion, your God reigns. Listen, you watchmen, lift up your voices. Together they shout for joy. The Lord returns to Zion. They will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. I chose this reading for that part. Uh, burst into songs of joy, you ruins of Jerusalem. The Lord has comforted his people. where He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Our world has gone through and is going through a tremendous amount of suffering right now with COVID-19. But our being able to gather again now for the, for the first time, just like this, a little bit spread apart, is like coming out of exile. I was reflecting on that, you know, that people have come back. And so this is like coming back to our Jerusalem. And, uh, and the words in that uh, prophecy from Isaiah about the ruins singing songs of joy is like the brokenness coming together and proclaiming the goodness of God despite what's happened, through what's happened, but continuing to trust in the Lord. And, and that's my call uh, to us together as a church. In, in some ways, there are ruins around us. There are ruins of some businesses are ruined. Some people are ruined. Some, there, is, there is real suffering. There is real tragedy in our land and around the globe. But in the, in, the, in, the, in the ruin, let us look to God and let us trust him and let us shout for joy. Uh, even the ruins cry out to the Lord. This Sunday... Uh, is Pentecost Sunday. It's the day that we particularly remember the coming of the Spirit uh, at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Uh, the Spirit came <clears throat> after the death of Jesus and the time that Jesus had uh, with uh, his disciples and followers and then he ascended into heaven and then uh, at the, in the upper room when they were praying together the Spirit came like in a wind and in a fire, the tongues of fire separated and, and, and came down upon every person there. They were filled with the Spirit and they spoke in tongues. That's what we also celebrate today. So as we are here in church, as we worship, as we, as we sing, as we pray, as we listen to the Word of God, the Spirit is here also. And uh, my prayer has been for this Sunday that He will minister to us all. Let's pray together. And I'm going to start that off, and then I want to uh, open it up for you to pray. We're not going to bring a microphone around today, um, but if you would like to pray, we're going to, I'd like us to pray for our nation. Pray for Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, for all of the, everything that's happening. I want us to bring the nation before God in, in our prayers today. So I'm going to start. And then if you'd like to pray, just you just speak out where you are. And we're just going to pray as a whole church together. And then after that, um, we, I'm going to pray. Toward the end, I'll pray a prayer of dedication of ourselves and all that we are to the Lord as a, in, a, in a kind of new way. So let's pray. Our Father God. We come to you through the Spirit, through our Lord Jesus. Lord, we come to you as your people. And Lord, thrilled to gather together in this way. But we come as your people, Lord. We come before your throne. We come before you and say, Lord, forgive us. Revive us. Renew us. Uh, re re replenish us. Refresh us. 
thank you, Lord, that you have been with us through this period of, of isolation. Because we have not been alone. Even if we've been in a bubble of one, you were there with us. And for this we give you praise. We thank you that we've been able to gather over the phone. We've gathered at a distance. We've gathered on Zoom. We've gathered in video and in music that's come through the, the uh, online. Thank you, Lord, that we had at this, these opportunities. But, Lord, we begin now to just cry out to you, our God, our great God, our powerful God, for our world and, that, and our nation, for this nation, Lord, for the people who are hurting in real pain and suffering, for people, Lord, who are lost, for people, Lord, who are wondering where does the next meal come from, how are we going to manage, for the children, for those who are vulnerable, Lord, we pray for them. Bring your hand of grace and mercy over our nation and our peoples, we pray. Now your turn.
boldness, Lord, to stand up and speak for those who cannot speak, Lord. We thank you, Father. We thank you for this boldness, Father. Humility. Humility we come to you, Father, this morning. That we can come into your throne room with our high priestess at your right hand side. Interceding for us. We thank you, Lord. You remember us, Lord. You forgive us for our sins. Forgive this whole world, Lord, for the things that we do for. We do not know what we do, Lord. At the cross, Father, you said, Forgive them, Father, for they don't know what we do. We don't know what we do, Lord. That's why we come to you, Father, because you know what to do, Father. Come back. Come back and guide us, Father. We don't know what to do, Father. We're lost. We're a lost sheep, Father. Come back. Revitalize us, Father, with your return. Let your will be done on this earth, Father. Come. Jesus. Um, Lord, we bring ourselves to you again now as your servants. Uh, Lord, to use us as we have prayed. Lord, take who we are and what we are and what we have. We commit it to your service as a church. Thank you for the, the gifts, the offerings, the, the food that has been brought in, Lord, brought here into your house and sent through the banking system, Lord. We thank you for all of that. What's, that's for that little letterbox down the back, and Lord. But Lord, we commit ourselves to you again, and, and thank you, Lord. We pray for the sick among us, Lord. We bless those who have been unwell. We thank you, uh, Lord, for Shona, and uh, we pray for Laurie for healing and for them as a couple to bless them as uh, Shona recovers from her, her uh, procedure that she's had done. Um, Lord, we pray for Jerry's son, Phil, that you'd continue to sh renew him and strengthen and heal him, Lord, as he faces a round of chemotherapy. Um, Lord, we pray for Susie, Lord, who asked for prayer this morning. Um, Lord, we pray for John getting a checkup in Wellington. Um, Lord, we pray, Lord, for others, Lord, um, that we would be healed and strengthened and renewed in your name, Lord. Amen. What a testimony, what a testimony of the, the goodness of God, the goodness of God. Just where you are, look around at someone, catch their eye, and just tell them with your eyes about the goodness of God, goodness of God, you know. Greet them with your eyes, greet them with your eyes, tell them about the goodness of God. And when you've done that, you can have a seat. Oh. When I... Um, was seeking God right at the beginning of the year. I was asking the Lord, what do you want, what do you want me to, what, what are we bringing to Napier Baptist Church this year in, in messages? And, uh, and, and I, I, felt I, I felt somehow led, we'll, we'll do the Ten Commandments. And we started that right before the lockdown. Right? And we've done one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Nine and then ten back together. I had no idea that was kind of going to happen. N didn't dream for a moment. And yet that series, in a way, has, has carried us through with the, with the, the, the videos I've been making and, and sending out. And I found myself week by week in my little, little office at home. Um, I've been asked about the grey wall behind me and there's the light switch. <laughs> And uh, I've sat down there and, and I found myself saying each time, and we're turning again to the, 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 and the next numbered commandment. So today we are turning to the 10th commandment. I did wonder and say, should, should we be doing something else? I just thought, let's round up the series and, and finish it. So we turn to the 10th commandment today. Perhaps this is the most subtle and some ways the most challenging of them all. 
if I can just find Exodus. So the 10th commandment. I turn again to the 10th commandment. <laughs> Sorry about there's no light switch. Uh, here's the 10th commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant or his ox or his donkey or anything else, Audi, that's there, and, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And that's how the Ten Commandments end. This one is subtle. This is, this is something that it's harder to, uh, to hide away from anyone. Uh, because you can covet things and you can be thirsting for what is not yours. But you can, you can try to keep that a secret. You might not be able to, but it's more subtle. And it, it really surfaces a question in us a question in us, a question that's internally in us, and it's really the answer to this question, what do you really want? What do you really want in your life? What do you really, really want uh, out of this life? What, where is your heart's desire? And so that's why I've used the glasses, because what are you looking at that you, that you want and, and you desire? You know, as we've gone through these, we've seen how in nearly every case, the Lord Jesus Christ takes that which was an external kind of requirement. This is what you do. And Jesus has really asked the question that goes, reaches inside us and says, but what's on the inside? And this question is all about the inside. What do we really, really want? You know, we've what we've talked about in the commandments is how God has put boundaries on things to give us freedom within those. And, um, and I've really enjoyed sharing and, and, and talking about them. But actually our dreams, our hopes, what, what we really want, what we hope for, those things need boundaries as well. They have, they have, a, a, they have boundaries as well. Uh, if, we, if we want the things that other people have, even their very own thing, if we want to possess it for ourselves, that becomes a hope and a dream and a desire that, that causes us, we can, be, we can be actually in a self-imposed poverty because we want something that we do not have. It's not ours. It belongs to someone else. And, and we can live like that, wanting and wanting and wanting, and it, you almost become an impoverished spirit because you're not satisfied with what you have. You just want what someone else has. We throw ourselves into a place of unhappiness and a place of restlessness because boundless desire is a very really dangerous thing. It takes away from our well-being, takes away from our contentment. It actually takes away from our true purpose in God. So what does it mean to covet? There's really only a, you don't say to people, you met at the coffee shop, what were you coveting this week? It's not what you talk about, is it? It's a, it's a different kind of word. Uh, well, actually, your watch. Uh, we, don't, we don't talk like that. So what, what does this word mean? What does it mean um, to covet? If we took a pure kind of translation of the original Hebrew, uh, it means something like desire, Okay, we got that. It, but it's more strong, it's more powerful than that. It's almost like lusting after something. Something I've got to have, something I, I've got to get. I want it so bad. Uh, it's something like taking a great uh, pleasure. It's something you set your dreams on and you must have that. It's interesting that the examples that God used in the law that he gave to Moses were about um, your neighbor's what was the first thing? It was their house. Probably for many of us, that would be the biggest asset we have. And uh, you're looking at, uh, um, if you're like me, you sometimes drive around and you look at people's houses. Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. And what, which, one, which one, if you could have any house along the street, which one would you have? And uh, drive around like that. I wonder whether in the original it was really about tent. Uh, your tent is so much bigger than mine because they were mobile people, right? It really means 
coveting your neighbor's dwelling place and you say but yours has got nicer the the hair is so soft in your tent you know beautiful it's yours is softer mine's kind of a bit more coarse wish I had a lovely soft tent like yours Uh, my neighbor's wife wish I had your wife your husband what kind of a comparison is that what kind of self uh, self uh, damaging thing are you saying when you're saying oh I I don't want you I want that one can you see how dangerous and desperate that really is this desire to have and to envy and to covet what other people have The spirit of comparison. Hey, darling, can you get your hair cut like, I'll just choose a random name, Darlene? Maybe you could act more like Bill. Bill's so cool. Uh, It demeans what you have. It exposes your insecurity and it exposes your sense of dissatisfaction. Actually, dissatisfaction in God and what he's given you. You think, I wish I had a bigger house or, or... or a, or a better ox, uh, or um, there was more chrome on my, um, my vehicle, or um, I really need that spa pool. Um, my neighbor's Harley Davidson. My neighbor does not have a Harley Davidson. Uh, uh, it leads that wanting, that in, wanting leaves a kind of poverty of spirit in us. We're just setting our desires on what we cannot have and what does not belong to us. Can you, I hope you can see how dangerous that is. I wonder if you know the, 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 the fairy tale about uh, the, the maiden, the woman who was kissing frogs. You know, remember that story? Cast your mind back. Um, the early childhood people among us uh, understand this really well. And so the girl is wanting her prince and he might be locked up inside some frog that needs to be kissed uh, by uh, and 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 the prince will come out and show so I think you can imagine the story she goes around looking for frogs is this the one frog frog croak croak and you're looking and you're just your whole life becomes focused on finding the right that frog And that frog is never the right one because you've kissed 16 today and none of them were the one. And you see this unrelentless desire to have something and it leads into dissatisfaction and happiness, unhappiness. Jesus spoke about this kind of desire of our eyes. As we've gone through this series, I've nearly always turned to the Sermon on the Mount And it's kind of um, really been, I've enjoyed that. Jesus uh, taught us to to lay up treasure on on heaven, not on earth. And uh, to store up treasure on heaven. And in the second half of Matthew 6, um, he talks about our eyes, our covetous eyes. And uh, uh, he said this, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great will that darkness be? The Jews uh, uh, had this idea that the, the eyes, you could look inside the eyes and you could see what was inside. And in many ways you can. When you look deeply into people's eyes, you actually can see. Sometimes you look at people and God will give you a word or a sense about someone. Uh, and, but, but they believed that if you looked inside, were you letting in the light inside you or were you letting in darkness? In other words, what are you looking out at and bringing inside yourself? And Jesus is uh, speaking to this use of the eyes for covetousness and desire and wanting more. And are we allowing light into ourselves or are we allowing in darkness and need and poverty?
the eye window. What are your desires? Are they focused on yourself? Or are they focused on what your neighbor has? Or are they focused on the kingdom, the kingdom of God? When we focus on something that we want that belongs to someone else, we actually begin to despise our brother or sister because they're in the way. And we start to drag them down. All these last six of the Ten Commandments are about our relationships with one another. If you look at your brother or your sister and want what they have, you become unsettled in your soul, but also you begin to destroy your relationship with that person because you no longer bless them. You just want what they have. It's a really destructive place to find yourself. One of the antidotes to covetousness is thanksgiving to God for what you already have that's been given to you yourself rather than saying, I wish I had one of those to be able to thank God and say, God, I thank you for the amazing gifts you know, that you made me that I'm, uh, I'm content in you. Jesus called himself the bread of life. He said that if we come to him, we'll never be hungry again. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. What did he mean? He meant that there would be incredible contentment and satisfaction about, being, uh, about, belonging, about belonging to Christ. Of contentment in him. Not hungry, not thirsty all the time, but content and restful in the Lord. Discontent, always thirsting, always hungering, really comes down to a lack of faith. We're saying to the Lord, I'm not satisfied. It's not good enough. I want more. You're not enough. It says to him, I'm worthy of more. How come you didn't give me that? I've got needs that you're not satisfying. Paul says it in, in 1 Timothy 6. He says, godliness with contentment is great gain. We have lived in a world that's relentless in its desire for more, haven't we? Isn't that our world is like? A consumerist world, a material, materialistic world. Right now, fractionally under six million people, I haven't looked up the statistic this morning, yesterday it was just a fraction under six million people uh, have uh, been infected with COVID-19. Many of them have recovered, many have not. Some have died. 365,000 gone up will, will, will have gone up since yesterday. Um, the world economy in a major crisis. You know it all. I don't have to say it here. Massive job losses. Huge programs of government borrowing, even in New Zealand. Cash injection into economies on the government's credit cards. Historically low interest rates, ecology suffering, negative interest rates, not just in Japan, but maybe around the world are coming, could come. Massive disruption, our borders are closed. This is going to produce change in our world. And there is the opportunity for good change and there's opportunity for bad change, I believe, in this time. Uh, I think that we're called to live in a different way as the people of God. A less me-centered way. A more generous and outgoing way. A less focus on what I want, but a great sense on, on ministering and blessing and helping others. This, this is the need of our, of, of our time. To bless others. To stop embracing what we want and begin to be able to reach out and share more and more and more. That's the calling, I believe. I think that's the word that God is speaking to us. Let's be a group more caring people right around the whole world. It's a connected world, but we've now got borders closed all around the world. Uh, but what is God saying to us? Is he calling us to a leaner, more equitable way to live? Let me finish with this this morning. 
that Jesus is the greatest treasure. The greatest treasure of all is Jesus. He's beyond comparison with anything else that the earth has. And we have Jesus. We've sung this morning, I believe in, in, I believe in you. I believe in you. He is beyond all comparison. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for his grace, his generosity, his mercy toward us. We should be so busy thanking God for what we have that we don't really shouldn't have much time for what we want anymore other than the things of God and to bring the kingdom of God in a greater, greater, and greater way. And so I love these words that are up on the screen now from the Apostle Paul. He wrote that he knew what it was like to have everything and he knew what it was like to have nothing. He experienced the whole, the whole gamut, the whole spectrum. And uh, someone who had incredible qualifications, humanly speaking, but he wrote this in, in the book to, uh, to uh, Philippi. Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ, Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things, he said. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Let's pray. Our Father, we want to thank you for Jesus, that you gave Jesus, that you sent him to this world, that we could be in him. He would be our Savior and Lord, that we would surrender our desires to him and live for what you want, Lord, not what we want, not my will be done, but your will be done, we pray. Thank you that he is the greatest treasure of all. Thank you, Lord, that you're, you obeyed Thank you, Jesus, for your obedience on that cross and that you demonstrated God, you showed us the Father, and you paid the penalties that we all should pay. But you stood there in our place and you hung there in our place that we might be free, that we might be redeemed through faith in Jesus Christ, through the grace and love and mercy that you have extended to the world, God. Thank you for sending your spirit into the world to continue, that we would not be alone, but you would dwell in us, that we together corporately would be the people of God and the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we belong together under you. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for all you've done. We bless you, Lord. Forgive us for when we have been dissatisfied, for when we have been frustrated and wanted more, Forgive us, Lord. Correct our hearts. Lord, let us open our eyes to see the needs around us and help others not fill up our own self more and more. Thank you, Lord, that your gift of love for us is greater than all we need and there's plenty left over to share and to give away and bless others. Amen.